Uh, and what I'm going to try and do is get you to help me with the question that I'm about to put up on the board because um, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of our approach, but I'm not going to give you an answer to that. Okay? Sorry if you have looked at that question and thought someone's going to give me an answer to that. I'm not. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this talk. Um, no, it's on the other side. Yeah. Right, okay. So the background. This is my school. Yeah. As you can see, it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. <laughs> this roof's got a hole in it. This roof's got a hole in it. In fact, we lost the whole roof just after, in fact, just over Christmas. Um, we've been heading to this in September 2012. Uh, we're a comprehensive 80, uh, 11 to 18 community school, rurally Sussex, 1,000 on the run. Um, I'm not an expert. I just felt the way that I was approaching teaching and learning was wrong. And I couldn't explain why. I've been a deputy head in two schools before that in charge of teaching and learning. And something didn't feel right. I was doing all these lesson observations, gathering all this data. I had, I had beautiful spreadsheets. Beautiful spreadsheets with colour coding, all sorts of things. And every year I used to get to the end of it and I go, right, next year. We're going to work on differentiation because differentiation is 0.62, <laughs> less of a grade of the other things that we were looking at. And then I kind of thought about it. I thought, well, hang on a minute. Actually, we looked at differentiation last year. And actually, when I think about it, I think I've looked at differentiation in every year that I've been a teacher. And then I looked at the other ones. Effective use of questioning was another one. Oh, hang on. Done that quite a few times as well. And that's when it started to feel that all of this data we were gathering and why we were doing observations started to feel wrong. Uh, just to give you a context, because I had the other thing, um, a former colleague of mine, Paul Banks, who's, if you follow Twitter, is Hibbs1974. Uh, we started to discuss this when I worked as a deputy head in his school, but we were in a different circumstance. We were requiring improvement was satisfactory at the time. We wanted to do this, but a bit more panicky about what was going to come next. Um, I arrived at Uplands and the Uplands school was greatly good at the time I arrived. Uh, I did have a jolly visit from the inspector last July, <coughs> the same day that I was moving house. So that was a really good experience last year and I'll explain how that went. Okay? So I do recognise that although we have a completely average intake, we are well above the national average in terms of our outcomes. I'm in a reasonably nice position to try these kinds of things. So we took a bit of a leap. And partly we took a leap because of this. This is the climate that I inherited, okay? We had short offset observations. In fact, I had two deputy heads that used to swoop around the school together with clipboards just before our weekly meeting on a Wednesday and sit down and tell us all the grade that had given for five or six members of staff, okay? Now, if you can imagine, that's not leaving the staff in a lot of joyful places about the reason that we're using observation. So gradings were made. Judgment on the quality of teacher from those judgments. Fearful staff. Ofsted used as the reason we've got to change because Ofsted are coming and they will kill us all and eat our children. Um, sorry, that's just the way that I think about it. Um, insects were then designed from the data. Guess what? Differentiation was one of the things we were going to be looking at. It meant very, people were very safe about their lessons. They weren't really thinking about how to move students on. Or they were just thinking, what do they want to see? when they come in, and what did we have as a school? We had okay progress, and we had okay attainment. <coughs> so the questions that kind of, came, kind of came out of this, and I apologise that some of these things I've written down. Why was there no real correlation for teachers we were judging as outstanding and their exam results? Well, hang on. If I'm judging these people as outstanding, their exam results should be outstanding. And more worryingly than that, why was it teachers we were judging as satisfactory? And I'm going to use old school terminology for this, because obviously we're in the new thing and we haven't been doing great since then. But why were teachers judging as satisfactory? Quite a lot of them actually had really good exam results. How is that possible? It comes back to your points, I think, lots of the time. How is it that our school had good or, good or better percentages that were high, and yet as a school we were kind of stagnating? Okay, our sixth form wasn't great in terms of its, its outcomes. Key stage four was good, but kind of ticking along. Why were staff not engaging in development? Why were they not being part of this whole process? 
And more importantly, why was everyone so fearful when I opened the door to go into their classroom? I mean, to the point of, God, what's he going to do? So, when I started to become a head, started to become a head, I'll have to explain that. I, I was employed a head in March, and then I actually became the head in September. And that's quite a long lead-in time for anybody. You start to think about things. So I started to read quite a lot. And Daniel Pink's book, Drive, hit a real few core parts to me about how you're going to motivate staff and that kind of idea of autonomy and mastery came through. A um, few quotes that we've all seen, I suspect. The Dylan Willem speech, or the quote, every teacher needs to improve, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. Tom might recognise this one, because it made a really big impact on me. <coughs> oh, sorry, so I did like this picture though. I don't quite know why you've been pixelated in such a way, but it's quite good. If there was no offset, no lead tape, no SOT, just you and your class, what would you choose to do to make it great? Well, just do that. It had a real profound impact on ways that I was looking at teaching and learning. But probably the most important book that I read in that period leading up to becoming a head was the Fuller and Hargreaves Professional Capital book. And it does come back to this thing that lots of people have talked to me about not grading lessons, as in, I'm giving everybody free range. There is real challenge in the school to performance and how teachers are performing. But if, it, if you allow people to think that if they fail at something, you are going to smash them to bits, well, that's going to be part of the problem. So we wanted to create this culture where any member of staff walking past a class We'd see something fantastic going on and we'll pop in and actually talk to the member of staff about how it was going. And the flip side of that, if it wasn't going well, we'd pop in and say, what can I do to help? What's happening? And none of us feeling like that was going to be a judgment made. I spoke to the SLT about, about this quite early on and I said to them, which members of staff are struggling? Which members of staff are good? Which members of staff would you put your house on, or let's face it, day two of an Ofsted inspection on, in terms of those people who are going to deliver outstanding lessons? And we all knew it. We all knew the answers to those questions. So why are we bothering going back to the checking part and doing observations to check what's going on? Okay, so we went for a change of approach. Outstanding practice, not outstanding performance. Nikki, who's over there, if you'd like to wave, that's Nikki's quote, which is very good. Stop turning around, Nikki. Um, and I really love that because that when Nikki started to turn some of these ideas into a kind of formalised practice, that quote really stood out for me. Because we're looking at typicality. And when Ofsted did arrive, and I had that awkward meeting about teaching and learning, where they'd observed a member of staff, they classed that member of staff as inadequate, and yet we agreed that that member of staff is generally good coming back to Tom's secret spreadsheet, where we have six points on it. And I actually challenged the inspector about, well, how can you judge that member of staff as inadequate? What have you got that I don't have that can really judge that teacher and that learning as inadequate? And we talked about that person's <clears throat> exam results, and we talked about that person's department and their exam results, and gradually the conversation turned to them accepting what we were saying, that we knew our teachers exceptionally well, and we knew their strengths, and we knew their areas of development, and probably knew that better by not doing lesson observations and not grading. Okay, I always say it's big though, because it is. Now when I put this quote on, and again, I thank Nikki for it, I read this the other way, in some ways, but, which way do we go from here? Because at some point, externally, someone is going to come in again and look at how we approach teaching and learning and want to be assured that we understand our school and what we're doing. It's natural to go that way. It is. It's there. Okay, so, we've only got a few more minutes and I know that people, we, you know, these kinds of things, we want to try and end on time because people have got long distances to go, but, I want you to just have a five minute conversation with this. How do you effectively monitor teaching and learning without grading lessons? Strategically, 
if you don't know where or how you, um, if you don't know where you are, sorry, I just realised that, if you don't know how you, where you're going, what development needs does each member of staff have if you're not observing their lessons? If you're not going in and telling them you need to do these things, how are they going to know? And importantly, as a school, what are our strengths and weaknesses? So, if you can just on your tables for five minutes, if you can pick someone who will feed something back on that, that would be marvellous. Okay, so five minutes. How do you fix it? Monitor teaching and learning without grading lessons.
In terms of observations, uh, appraisal observations are done by peers. So it's not a, a member of SLT going in and doing the appraisal, it's a peer that goes in and the developmental targets come from that observation. So how are they doing against those developmental targets? What are they doing about those developmental targets? Um, we fo focus on the teaching and learning aspects um, uh, and the, in the teaching standards and also in, in terms of our college improvement plan. Um, we can monitor individuals' progress on specific standards over time. We also have something in the school which is called every classroom on call, and I'm sure other people have a similar thing, which is that for every hour of every day, there is a senior leader or a senior teacher walking the corridors. Now, we do that with a, um, a walkie-talkie if there's an issue, but of course, what you're doing is you're walking, you're, getting, you're starting to feel where things feel wrong or feel, things feel really right, and that kind of typicality comes into it. And I think, if I remember rightly, that was a, a defining moment from the Ofsted inspection, when we kind of said, well, we're observing every hour of every single day, in effect. <coughs> and I think that was quite a powerful message. Um, we also really focus in on, on students. So for example, when we do um, learning walks, again, <coughs> we particularly like learning walks, or learning observations, we actually focus in on the students. So we've just done one on pupil premium, where we've looked at students and how they're learning in different lessons, what homework they're being setting, how their books are being assessed. It's all focused on the students and the feedback comes back as a generality. This is where we've seen really good learning for those groups of pupils. That's where we'd like to get people to work together. And then the reputational knowledge, which Tom very handily mentioned this morning, which is, um, which is kind of that middle leader audit where heads of faculty are telling us what are the development needs of their team, um, we look at in terms of SIMS, in terms of how staff are doing rewards and how they're handing out sanctions. Contribution to the college, you know, that member of staff who is always out in the corridor, that member of staff who is always putting on something at lunchtime, that member of staff is always kind of there or thereabouts when you kind of need them. And then finally we talk to students, and this is the kind of the next stage for us, is actually making those student voice questionnaires useful for us to help staff move on. But the most important part to all of this is a recognition it's all about development. And it's that idea of thinking back to five period days, and no matter how good I thought I was as a teacher at that time, in that five period days, I knew I could deliver every level of lesson based on tiredness, students, all sorts of things. 
And it's that idea that we need to be much more holistic in terms of what we're doing with teachers. So we 10 minutes ago, we thought we'd open it up for any questions. You're not going, I'm afraid. <laughs> 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 If we replace graded lesson observations with something like reputational knowledge, yes. do, we, do, we, do, we, do we mystify some of the decisions that are going to be made around funds pay? Do we not put more power into the hands of uh, the judgment of individual head teachers? That's, that's a big concern. I've got, again, it's a trust based, you know, I don't, I don't I think if, 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 if the staff at Uplands felt that this was all about pay, I think it all collapses. The whole thing collapses. If it's about pay, yeah. then it, it, it just disappears. This is not about pay, this is about moving staff and developing staff and making them feel that it's part of a process. Can I come back to that? Yeah, of course. <coughs> um, you may think that the debate in your school said it's not about pay, but when the debate nationally clearly is about yeah. pay, then I think, you know, that it does, in some senses it doesn't matter how much trust that they have in you individually, they know that you're going to be banned. Yes. By, by national conditions. But most of, that, most of that conversation is not, to me, that's middle leaders. Middle leaders are making those, you know, we're just doing our interim appraisals at this moment in time. Middle leaders are the ones that make some of those decisions. And one of the reasons why we adopted the NASUWNUT performance appraisal policy is because it said the right thing in it. It said you need to provide evidence to show that you can move on. And the rest of it, I thought, well, that just stops the whole argument. It's got the thing that I want in there, and that's the end of it. I do understand your point, but it comes from trust. Can I come back yeah. to that? So just, um, in a way, I think that's more honest, because at least we're not pretending that the graded lesson observation means anything in that. Mm -hmm. And in that, because it really, it really does come down to grading lessons. At a, at a really kind of reductionist level of whether you like it or not. And at least this, at least we're owning up to that here. Rather than, yeah. rather than dressing it up. I I would get that point. Where, 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 where can a member of staff go, right, I want to see my reputational knowledge felt. I want to know where you have me because I can play a game around um, around observation, storm observation. I can you know, I, I can make sure I'm secure, but if you can't play a game around reputation models, then... But that's, the Kevin, it's, it's the three things. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, if someone was always out in the corridor, but every lesson was a mess, yeah. you know, truly a mess, children getting hurt, that wouldn't really have much of an impact, no. if, that makes, if that makes sense. I mean, I've got science staff who fill like, <coughs> baths up with water and dress up in you know, wetsuits to, you know, to show that side of things or put custard on the floor so the kids can walk across the cut. Now, let's face it, that lesson I remember over almost every other lesson that ever happened in, in the school. But when you go and observe that member of staff on the old style, they get themselves into a complete mess trying to tick the boxes. And that's partly why, I think. But I don't think there's a real great answer to that. Can I just, sort of just mention about that, you know, how it works here is I mean, it's interesting, you have to, you know, you have to rely on some level on head teachers working with integrity and so on. I mean, you've got you know, head teachers who are making um, you know, judgments which are unfair, and you obviously have, as a teacher, you need to, you need to say, well, I want, you know, if you had that situation, you would say to a teacher, well, you should have a formal observation and, and have hard data because you don't trust a head teacher's judgment. But normally, what, how it works for me is that there are teachers who I just know are awesome teachers because of their high reputational standing and the kids love their lessons and they love being in them and they're like regarded as legends. We might go in and see a lesson motivation and the criteria. They might stuff it up and then they get a, yeah. you know, it's just, it, they don't deliver in that environment. So how do I know that they're a great teacher? Because of these other, all this other information, which is the aggregation of hundreds of comments and bits of feedback. So I think that almost in, in every case where that's, you, you use that, it's in the teacher's Favour. Yeah. The other thing that I would say, <coughs> based on the kind of the weight of evidence which I've you know shown you, literally tip of the iceberg off. If I was a member of staff and I was on capability because of less than grade lesson observations, I think I'd have a very strong legal case. Mm. Um, I'm going to. Uh,